Um, today I'm going to be talking about session management and the fact that it is possible to make it secure. Um, the goal of today's talk is that everyone should walk away feeling like I already knew this information. Uh, this talk has been advertised as a novice talk, so if you know nothing about security and you feel like you want to know something about security, this is the talk for you. Uh, my personal theory is that everyone should already have this information but you don't realize that it's actually security information, and so everyone knows a little bit more about security than you think they do. So, if you walk away feeling like I know a little bit, then you know a little bit about security, and hopefully this is a field that you're gonna to wanna to get involved in. So, my name is Siren. I, my little graphics don't work. Oh, there we go. Here's a picture of me at work. I work defense uh, security for a medical company in Sweden, so we have a lot of very, very sensitive information. And unlike my red team brothers and sisters, I work blue team, so I work keeping people away from the data and keeping people out of systems rather than getting into systems. I started on that particular line, uh, but realized that blue team was way cooler, so I started in defense. Um, you can find me at securitypony.com, or securitypony at Twitter, forgive me. Um, I can't say that I have a particularly active Twitter feed, but if you have questions that I don't answer in this presentation, um, either grab me after or talk to me on Twitter, and I usually respond pretty quickly. Um, I have been working in security for, I'm going to go with nine years, maybe? A long time. Uh, long enough that I've seen most of the big bugs come and go, and I've seen most of the big mistakes uh, stay. So unfortunately, the mistakes that I've seen when I started working with security are the same mistakes that I'm talking about today. Which, from my perspective, means that we in the security community, myself included, have failed at getting more people involved in the community. We've failed at describing the problem. And so we have failed our fellow developers because people are making the same mistakes over and over and over and over again. So, I am hoping to address this today. Um, some other random facts about me, I really like the color red, I like dogs, and I run a security group in Sweden, so if you're ever in Sweden and want to, to learn more about defense, uh, come check us out. We're security, because I drink tea, I don't drink beer, and we're in the southern part of Sweden. Totally free, we have free beer, free pizza, so if you're in Sweden, come hang out with us. So, today's particular talk was born of two common myths that I hear all of the time. And just by a show of hands, who has ever heard, we don't have to care about sessions because we have a smart card, a dongle, two-factor authentication, therefore it doesn't matter, therefore we can't be compromised. Has anyone heard that? Hands up, come on, be brave. No one's ever heard this. There's like three people over there not lying to me. So thank you to those three. The other one, is that our token is secure because we use SSL or HTTPS. Hands up to the two brave dudes in the front. Thank you. And, and the rest of you are just like, I have no idea what she's talking about. Does this, does this go away like this? So I'm pretty sure that most people have heard that particular bottom one. You're just not brave enough to put your hand up. And that's, that's okay. I don't mind. I don't mind. So, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background first. HTTP is stateless, which shouldn't come to a shock to anybody. And the reason this is important is the fact that HTTP is stateless is why we use sessions at all. So session was built or created, depending on who you ask, to kind of solve the problem of HTTP's lack of state. And this becomes relevant because most web pages that we use today are actually web applications. So you go to Amazon, it's not actually a web page, it's a web service. So you're buying things, in my case, everything that Amazon shows me is red because it's my favorite color. And that particular information is kept in the session about me. So if you want to sell me crap, make it red, and I'll probably buy it. Or stick a dog on it, I'm sold. And so this becomes relevant because even if you're in an HTTP place, you can still have state that's maintained. So you have to make sure that state is secure. And most people are like, well, I haven't logged in. Therefore, it doesn't matter. I don't have a password. It's just HTTP. It's just the crap she's looking at. No one cares. But a common thing that I find is that state is, or session is assigned before I log in. So Amazon, for example, I'm looking at a bunch of grab crap. I sign in. 
does my session change if my session was assigned before I log in? So you can just ponder that one. The answer is no, by the way, in case you were wondering. So there are two main vulnerabilities that we're going to be talking about today. We're going to do these in order. And the first one is a weakness that is generated from the session tokens themselves. So if I create a session, do I do it in a good way? And I am apparently parched because this light is really bright, so excuse me. And the second one is how I handle them after they have been created. So, finding a session. We are gonna start with how you find a session because I deal with a lot of brand new pen testers, I deal with a brand new developers, I deal with a lot of brand new testers in general, and they will come running to me and they'll be like, I found the session. And it is the common session set by the browser that isn't actually the session that's used by the back end. So before you start looking at session and have I done this in the right way, make sure you're actually looking at the sessions that are being used by the back end that's actually relevant. Session to give can be found in a couple different places. It can be lodged in the cookie, it can be found in the URL, and it can be found in the hidden forms. Now, you can have a session that's used by different parts of the backend, so you can have different sessions running in the same session. But backend one could be using one found in a hidden form, and backend two could be using one found in the cookie. So it's very important to figure out which session is relevant for what you're looking at. Now, if you have the session that assigns my favorite color, that's probably not gonna be a big deal. But if you have the session that has my username and passwords and accounts, I'm probably gonna be having a really bad day. So it's really important that you can figure out which session does what, because there's not necessarily only one. So, you can do this by any number of ways. The most common is probably spidering the website. And there are a bunch of different tools that can do this for you, or you can do this by hand. If you're just starting testing, or if you're just starting security, I recommend a tool called OWASP Zap Proxy. Super user-friendly, super well-documented, and it'll do this for you. So you click around the website, and it'll help create the session for you. You can also look at little plugins like edit this cookie and stuff like that that'll kind of help you find the cookie and help you kind of understand what is going on where. If you use Chrome Tools, Developer Tools, the new, uh, whatchamacallit, Developer Tools, uh, also has a pretty good session editor that you can get a good understanding of what's going on under the hood. Now, this is a list of where token generation generally screws up. And the reason I made this list is that most people consider that tokens are only relevant when I log in. And this is super, super easy, you know. You know. So, password recovery, the way this flow usually works, is that I log in and I realize, shit, I forgot my password. And so I click, I forgot my password, and it sends a token to my email, and that token lives forever and ever 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 and ever. Not only that, your website allows concurrent sessions and it doesn't validate the password, which means that now I can log in from two different places from two different people and you will never know. Second place is in hidden forms. For some reason that I do not understand, people assume that hidden forms means it's hidden from everybody but them, and so they'll stick a session in a hidden forms and assume <laughs> if it's true. I wouldn't have it on here if I didn't see it. Um, they wouldn't... <laughs> That totally got off myself, I'm sorry. So, they assume it's hidden from everybody but them. No one else will figure it out because they're geniuses. And so they stick it in a hidden form, and then they just leave it there. And everyone's kind of smiling and nodding. And I get this when I say it a lot, because everyone's like, I would never make that mistake ever because I am a genius. And as long as you work by yourself with no other coders ever, refactor and maintain your own code forever, that's probably true. However, it's very rare to see one developer with no external dependencies at all that maintains their code forever. Maybe you are that particular unique individual, but for the vast majority, myself included, this is not true. One-time access to protocol-protected passwords or protocol-protected anything, the one-time access is the key phrase there. One-time access means one-time access. Oops, sorry. 
And generally, one-time access means you actually have to kill the token, kill the session that's associated with it after the one time. If you don't do that, one-time access becomes access. The remember me function in browsers kills me because it means you're leaving the session in the browser. Please don't do that. Just for me, you, please don't do that. And finally, the current status of the customer's order. And I didn't exactly know what to call this, so I called it a sentence. But if I'm, if I'm shopping on Amazon and I'm buying a bunch of crap, a bunch of bread crap because it's me, and I leave the browser for a while, can somebody else call the back end to see the current status of what I am doing? If I come back to the browser, is my shopping cart still full? I've been gone from Amazon for months, but I come back and all of my red crap is still in the cart. That should give you pause because that means that somewhere, some session has maintained what was in my cart. And unless that's been protected, that's, that information has just been kind of floating, hanging there, and that, that should give you pause. So here we have a session that looks super complex, right? Top number, super complex. And a session can look like this. And unfortunately, this is just a collection of hexadecimals. If you run it through a decoder, this is what it says at the bottom. Everybody following me? Now, unfortunately, if one of those was app my password, it's not super complex anymore. And more people than just you can run a decoder. So consider what information you put in the session, because no matter what the top string looks like, someone like me or one of my lovely brothers and sisters in red will be trying to decode it. So even if you encrypt it, you can do something called bit flipping, where I call your website over and over and over and over and over, and I harvest session after session after session, which means that I'm gonna to start to have an, e an easier time decoding that top bit. So word to the wise is consider what you are putting in your session. I have found, this is totally true, the account name, username and password, first and last name, IP address, bank information, home addresses, and hidden information, all left in the session in a semi-encrypted state. And this is often, it's just hexadecimals or ASCII, which can be decoded in less than a second. You can write a spider that'll just pull session after session after session after session, and all of a sudden you have a bigger problem than what you started with, because from a visual perspective, that number up there doesn't say anything to most of us. Me, I would, I would run it through a decoder, but most people would not. Random tokens are my next favorite item because the human brain is not random at all. No matter how random you think you personally are, and I usually describe myself as a rather unique individual, people aren't random. So they try and use a, 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 a new library to create randomness. So they'll pull something off open source, they'll pull something off GitHub to create randomness. But how random is your randomness, realistically? Who, by a show of hands in here, has used random tokens? No one in here has used a random token. Okay, there's like four brave people over there. Thank you for not making me feel totally stupid. Thank you. Who in here has tested for randomness? So the four brave people over there have probably guessed that their randomness is random, right? Not sure. So how, how would you test for that? So we're gonna have a random token, and how do we know it's random? We've pulled something off GitHub and it says it's random. That probably shouldn't be good enough. But for some reason, people think it is. So just a slight sidebar from my point. If you're testing for randomness, create a large scope of random tokens, and then calculate the probability of a certain characteristic showing up. Look at the large scope of tokens that you've just created, and if it shows up or not, then you can have kind of a quote of how random that particular subset is. Unfortunately, a lot of the random number generators are algorithm plus a nonce, which isn't actually random because if I get a large subsection of your tokens, I can reverse that, figure out the algorithm you're using, 
and then I will have a session that from your backend's perspective is totally valid because I've found your secret algorithm and then just added notes. My personal favorite, SSL will save us. No, see, see, it's, everyone's kind of smiling and nodding like they, they would never see this. And my personal hope is that when people say SSL, they actually mean TLS. Uh, most people do not. <laughs> they think that SSL will save us um, because it's encrypted and therefore no one needs to care because, and then they can't seem to finish the end of that sentence. Which, which surprises me because if I made such a declarative statement of SSL will save us, then I would like to be able to finish the end of the sentence. Uh, and I have yet to run into a person that will say that and give a reason. Now, the reasons I read online, and people are always braver online, is that, well, it's on the customer's responsibility to make sure that their Wi-Fi is up to date and that they're not surfing on God knows what. Um, yeah, and I don't really buy that defense. At some point, you have to take responsibility for your own code. So, here's the problem with SSL, or we're relying on encryption. We always forget the network. So here, who here, by a show of hands, hand up, is using the Wi-Fi in this building? There's like three of you. Either you, nobody participates, or everyone has realized the Wi-Fi in here is really, really slow, and I can't really figure out what it is. But let's say we're all using the Wi-Fi, which means we all have to go through the same routers, and how do we know that the session that we're using to browse to whatever it is, isn't being logged in the particular routers that we're going through. We don't. We don't know that at work. We don't know that when we're on our telcos, on our phones. We don't know that on our ISPs. So if the session that you're using is being logged and written to a logged server somewhere, then your, then your session has already been exposed, even behind an encrypted tunnel, whatever it is, because it has to be decrypted at some point. So the key factor there is that when that happens, that information isn't useful to the attacker anymore. Because I can tell you that people can hack telcos, they can hack the Wi-Fi, they can hack whatever it happens to be, and if you're relying on the fact that no one will do that, then you're gonna have a really bad day from me to you. Using HTTPS to, oh, that light is seriously super bright, to log in, and then you have HTTP after. And this is really, really common in most web mail clients, that you log in with HTTPS, and thereafter you have HTTP, because you, you trust HTTPS to handle the login, so you send your username your, and your password in an encrypted state, but everything after that is in HTTP. The problem being is that if I can redirect from the HTTP instance to the HTTPS instance, I can grab the session from there. Not only that, everything that is sent in HTTP, if we are on the same network, I can read it. So it doesn't matter that I can't see your username and password because everything else has already been exposed. Not to me per se, but to again, one of my red brothers or sisters. HTTP, in areas before login, so my Amazon example, Amazon does not do this, by the way, so I'm just picking on Amazon to pick on Amazon. But if I am shopping on anywhere, and I put a bunch of red crap in my cart, and then I log in, does my session change? So if I have been assigned session one, two, three, four, five, six, I log in, and my session is still one, two, three, four, five, six, we're gonna have a massive problem. Now, by a show of hands, we're gonna do this crowd participation until you play with me. How many people have actually checked that? Now this lack of hands up is more what I'm used to because most people don't check that, and this is a giant, massive bug that is far more widespread than it has any right to be. So, when you're going back to your code, please check this one, just to make me happy, please. And finally, HTTP for all static pages. Now, if we look at where the internet started, most protocols when the internet started were HTTP because it was all static pages. You know, you had your glowing, bouncing skull, the visitor counter, I, my page is probably still out there somewhere. And so you didn't really need anything to actually log into because there was nothing to log into. It was just a static page of, I'm super cool with my bouncing skull and my visitor counter. The problem being that you still see a lot of HTTP static content on web pages, which means that you have HTTPS mixed with HTTP traffic 
in the same tunnel, which means that you can serve HTTP traffic to an HTTPS tunnel and break the HTTPS. If I can post stuff to your encrypted tunnel, you're going to have a bad day because what I'm going to be posting is bad. You see there's a lot on blogs. I talked a little bit about logs, and this is mostly true if you have a static session or something like that. Where exactly is that information logged? And should you be logging the session at all? I don't have an answer. Sometimes the answer is going to be yes, sometimes no, but it's something that should be considered. Should your session be logged in the browser log? Should it be left in local storage? Should the browser be aware of it at all, for example? Should it be in the web server logs, which means it's out there on the internet for everybody else to peek at? ISP or proxy logs, should it be logged there? I've looked at a lot of proxy logs in my long, long career at this point and seen a lot of static sessions that are, believe it or not, still active, despite the fact that nobody has touched them in months, but they're still laying there and the back end, in that case, still responds, which, sure, scary, scary stuff. I've talked a little bit of logout, and I'm going to talk a little bit again again. Um, it is shocking the number of web pages that don't have a logout function that's implemented. I go to your web page, I log in, and for whatever reason, there is no logout function. And why this is, I have no good explanation. The next most common thing is that I log out and I don't actually log out. So I press the log out button, the browser shows me a logged out page, but I can still talk to the back end. All of you are looking at me like, that would never happen to me. But if it wasn't a problem, it wouldn't be on this slide. This is particularly problematic if you're running a cluster of servers. So I log in, and server A handles my login information, handles my username and password. I log out from server D. So A thinks my, server, my session is still active, but D is convinced that I logged out. So I can still talk to server A for as long as I want to. How do you handle then concurrent sessions? So if I'm allowed to log into more than one place, how should those sessions be handled when a logout function is pressed in one of them? Should everybody be kicked out immediately? Should you be kicked out in 10 minutes? What server should handle the logout? For whatever reason, these questions aren't asked. And again, I have no ID. I'm just here to kind of give you some, some pointers. So the, the key thing to consider in this slide is, does your front end and your back end actually speak to one another? And do they speak to one another on a regular basis? I know it's really popular right now for many companies to have like a front end team and a back end team, and then you build like the wall of China between them so they never, ever, ever, ever speak because I'm a back end developer, so I don't do headers, and I don't do login, and I'm a front end developer, so I make everything beautiful. And for whatever reason, like, they don't meet in the middle, which means session kind of dies in the middle. And it, but again, no idea why. A few words on cookies. The most important one is that they are delicious. And I'm hungry. So if you have a cookie, meet me after this talk. I'm really hungry. Um, there are two main things uh, to consider when we're talking about cookies. The first one is domain restriction, and the second one is path restriction. Um, I see a few blank faces, so don't worry, we're going to talk about what the difference between those two is right now. Domain cookies. So when I set, or when a domain sets a cookie, the browser automatically sets it to all of the subdomains under it. So if I have pony.com and a subdomain appsetpony.com, and appsetpony.com sets a new cookie, then it will set to all of the domains under that one. Now, there's a great function that's here at the tail end of my slide that's called domain, and that means that it will set to the parent domain as well. So if you have a subdomain that handles your authentication, for example, you can use domain to set the cookie to the parent domain of that domain. However, if we're talking about pony.com and you have another completely separate puppies.com, then you have to have something over there on puppies because pony only handles pony over here. Now, one thing that's really important to consider when we're talking about domain cookies is it sets to all of the subdomains under there. So if you have some functionality that's super, super sensitive, or you don't want anybody else to see it, or you have security that probably isn't quite as 
I'm going to go with advanced as on your authenticate, authentication domains, then you have to consider separating those two because ponydime.com will also be set to test app and it'll also be set to super secret at ponytime.com, which means that if I can start playing with the sessions, all of a sudden I have working sessions in super secret at ponytime.com and test at, at, po test at, at ponytime.com which is gonna be really, really problematic. So you wanna look at separating your domain structure if you wanna talk about using domain cookies. The other one is the cookie path. And so if we're setting a cookie here, then we're going to set it on my app. And apparently I, yeah, there we go. And so the cookie for, will be set for my apps and all of the subdirectories under there. Now, it's going to look like that, and we set it to path, which means that everything that's associated with apps and the directories there under will get a new cookie, it'll get a new session associated with it. Now, there's something that's super, super important to keep in mind when separating cookie path, because it, it gets confused with same origin, same origin a lot of the time. Same origin cares about port and protocol. This one cares about path. So when you're considering which security mechanism to use, Consider wisely. If port protocol is important to you, then same origin is where you want to go. That means that everything in the same domain is going to be same origin. However, if the path is super important to you, then this is where you want to go. And the, the key can, thing to consider here is that we have ponytime.com.apps1 and apps2. They will be separated. Otherwise, if you're using something on domain, the session that's tied to ponytime.com ponytime will be stealable between apps one and apps two if you open a referrer in the browser. So the session there will be pested between the two. I promised you defense, and here it is. So this is just a few pointers to consider defense when we're talking about session management. Have an extremely, extremely large variables to create sessions. The larger the better, because the more time I have to spend getting sessions to actually find relevant information, the better. You as a defense person have to find every single hole that I as the attacker can find and defend all of them at the same time. I as an attacker, I have all of the time in the world. I can sit there and eat chips, drink my soda, and just wait. So the larger the amount of possibilities that I have to plow through, the better. When you're looking at randomization, apparently we only have three dudes over there that were, but for the rest of you, if you're looking at how to create random tokens, choose a good library. Make sure it's not just algorithm plus nonce. If you want some extra credit, add some entropy to make it even more difficult for me to figure out what exactly you're doing. Because again, you want to make your application as difficult as possible for me to break into. Because it's the more difficult, the harder you make my life, the more likely it is that I'm going to swim away and attack somebody else. And that's what you want. You want me to just go away. Restrict the amount of information that's kept in your tokens. So I see this a lot that when we're looking at tokens, you're going to stuff all of the information possible in the same token for the sake of convenience and between me and you because developers are lazy, myself included. So really consider the amount of information that needs to be in your session. Generally, we see a lot of information in sessions and not all of it's used. So I would argue it's smarter to just restrict the amount of information in the session at all. Tokens should never, ever, ever, ever be transmitted over HTTP. If they are, consider them ruined, consider that a hacker has personally looked at them, personally touched them, send them over HTTPS at all times, forever and ever and ever and ever. Session tokens shouldn't be available in URL. That's a really declarative statement, and there are definitely some times where it's necessary, and when it is necessary, you should definitely be aware of the risk that you're inviting to your application. So this is kind of a general statement of best security practice of don't stick them into your URL, no. URL, but if necessary, just be aware of the risk that you are inviting into your application because it's easier for me to get at them. Make sure your logout function works. Uh, when I'm pen testing an application, I always start with logout, and I've always started with logout, and it is still the place that I find the most bugs, and I've been doing this for a really long time, and I'm bored of finding the same bugs over and over and over again. So please, just make sure logout actually works. When your session time is out, what is the time? 
how long should your session live? And this can be a 30 second session, that might be relevant. It might be a three year session, it doesn't really matter as long as you make a rational risk-based assessment of how long the session should live. And that should be a risk-based decision, that shouldn't be the developer thought that five minutes was good. That should be a discussion, that should be something that's considered. And finally, what do you do with concurrent sessions? Should you allow somebody to log in to the same instance from two separate IPs? If so, how does that person, is that person aware of the fact that there is another session that is active against their instance? Is there anything they should do about it? Should they validate that? Should they say it's okay? It, and it might be, but that's something that should be considered. And a key success factor. This is a picture of the CTO of my company. Hi, Mundo. <laughs> and the reason I have him up is that I'm the head of security, and he is the CTO, and we have dynamically opposed roles. His job is to build great things. My job is to keep people away, which means that generally my stuff takes longer. It's true. So I am lucky enough to work with somebody that empowers my role, which means that we have a lot of time discussing things. And what's great about that is that he has proved me wrong. There are a lot of times where best security practice simply isn't relevant, or the fact that the product handles the risk in such a way that the likelihood of the whatever exploit I'm currently freaking out about will never ever happen. And it's really, really easy when you're working in security to think that you are all by yourself. And this is so dangerous, and it's something that I really encourage people to consider, is the fact that you're never ever working by yourself. You usually have a team of developers around you, even if you can't see them. So you can go to forums, you can go to GitHub, you can go to my personal favorite, Google, and just ask for help. Because no matter what security problem I'm facing, session management, whatever the case may be, you're not facing it by yourself. And it's really easy when you're working with security and you find some particular problem that you get overwhelmed and you're like, oh God, I can't deal with this. Or you realize that no matter what I do, we're screwed. There, there is, it's an unsolvable problem. It's a chicken or the egg. And there are ways, there are people that have faced that particular problem before that can help you kind of find a solution that will help you. So I always have a little picture of Uto, just to kind of point out the fact that you're not working by yourself. And in security, that's really, really important to consider. So I wanted to end today, because I think my time is up, I think. I've talked for 45 minutes, um, by talking about a little bit of tools. I mentioned OWASP Zap Proxy, and it is created by OWASP, the Open Web Application Standards Project. If you're getting started in security, I highly recommend going to them. Had I been a little smarter, I would have put in a link here. But OWASP.com, they specialize in bringing people into the security community. We have tons and tons and tons of how-tos, best practices, test examples, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and our forums, we try, I'm one of their members and one of their administrators, we try and keep them to an open and friendly place. So if you have questions, that's definitely where you should be going to. So that's all I had for you today. Um, so this is my very, very first time here in this country and at this particular conference. I had hoped to learn how to say thank you in Bulgarian, but I can't. So please pretend like I did. I, I, tried to, I tried to learn three times yesterday and I screwed it every, every time. And my host was so sweet that he was like, oh, that's great. And you could see on his face that I was not saying it well. So I'm not going to butcher your language anymore. But please pretend like I said thank you. Um, because I, I'm very grateful that I'm here. I was very excited to be asked. Um, so if you have any questions, please go ahead. And if not, then thank you. <laughs>